and uh, G. Uh, the uh, and uh, sorry, I, I basically I was busy trying to record my lecture for my students. Now you see what happens. Uh, so in any event, I I, uh, uh, I want to assure you that uh, I came here not because I have a back door. I didn't know the organizer, uh, but I hope uh, he didn't make a mistake uh, inviting me. Uh, but I, I basically, I'm going to share with you uh, our view, world view that has changed in the last 10 years because of uh, uh, some of the work we have done in the last 10 years. So most of this uh, involve entangled polymers. And as you know, the goal uh, of rheology, polymer rheology, is to develop constitutive relationships and to learn how we can apply constitutive uh, laws to describe processing. And uh, the challenge is how you can derive such relationship from molecular viewpoint, because that's a gap of six order of magnitude. So my talk uh, uh, really consists of two parts. I will begin with a review of what is known phenomenologically. And uh, I will spend most of my time there. And then I hope to show you what are the emerging uh, conceptual pictures from the rheology that we have. So for example, in this movie, you see that uh, uh, it is uh, basically a, a extrusion, uh, which is a key part of what we uh, are going to talk about. And uh, uh, this extrusion was done with, uh, you can see, uh, my, see, I try to use dual display, it doesn't work. And once it messed up. Uh, so so I, you cannot see my mouse. I have to try to use my laser then. So basically, this is like solution with constant uh, pressure. And uh, if you, uh, gosh, there's a little control I have here. If you keep eating, increasing the pressure, it will uh, change from just shark skin like and eventually spur. And so, key concepts are things like uh, wall slip and uh, extrusion. And this kind of behavior 10 years ago was too complicated to me, for me. And that's why we step back to look at it uh, uh, more simple, in a more simple way. Eventually, we like to have molecular level understanding of why this is possible. So let me begin quickly by saying that extrusion is something we know for a long, long time. Bagley had this uh, spur, demonstration of spur of uh, uh, high density polyethylene. Todala did a lot of work in trying to analyze what's happening as the material enters the dye and concluded that this could be a elastic instability. And then Vinogradov uh, have done, grabbed some of the polyisoprene and did a lot of work showing spur-like behavior. But their conclusion uh, was, uh, 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 they think this was a fluid to solid transition. So in any event, by the time when I start to learn about the field, uh, it was presented by Morton Dan that this is a paradox, that the spur behavior. And, uh, it was unclear until we start to look a little closer at how boundary could be altered during the uh, uh, extrusion, for example. In particular, Dejin was first to rediscover the concept of slip length and the idea of how to quantify slip. And in particular, he was the first to visualize or to demonstrate that the magnitude, this mouse comes, now the magnitude actually de is determined by the viscosity ratio of the bulk viscosity versus what's happening at the interface. So if you conceivably could see the interface start to disentangle, as I showed on the right, then the viscosity ratio can be huge, then you have a lot of slip. So it turns out uh, uh, in either case, this phenomenon can be demonstrated to be actually just a interfacial phenomenon. In particular, you can remove that by what uh, surface treatment, or uh, actually Bagley already called, told us why, why this is interfacial, because it has hysteresis. And uh, the bulk is fresh, so it cannot undergo hysteresis. So in any event, if we move on, is there anything beyond wall slip? Well, it turns out you need to be patient. You have basically, I don't see this laser working, or it's not very thin. Basically, as you increase your rate, you will continue to have higher amount of wall slip until you reach maximum level. Only beyond that level, the bulk will start to be sheared more strongly beyond terminal. Uh, 
So basically, you need to share farther and farther, higher and higher in rate in order to probe what happens in the ball. You can see now, you must understand and get rid of and get, get a handle on how wall sleep takes place if you are ever to learn anything that's going to happen in the ball. But the question really is, if this first happened at the interface, naturally, eventually, does it happen in the bulk? What I mean by that is eventually whether the disentanglement could take a place in the bulk. So I will start first with the, the phenomenological part, and uh, I will basically quickly go through what I think is ABC of nonlinear rheology, and I'll give you some circumstantial evidence of disentanglement that leads to the concept of yielding through the observation of particle tracking velocimetry. And now I will try to unify the field of shear and extension to show you why they are the same at the, in the zeros order, and then discuss some differences. I will have no time to discuss the last subject of uh, conspiracy criteria that is uh, uh, something heavily invoked in the literature. And I will merely by going that by saying that uh, the, really the stress maximum, which one sees as an indication of strand localization is really just a consequence. It's not a cause for the strand localization. But I will have no time to discuss that. So let me go with ABC. You know, 100% deformation. The time it takes is T1, denoted there. And that time, if it's much shorter than the Maxwell time, or reputation time, your favorite, or terminal relaxation time, then you enter the region of so-called shear thinning. In other words, then you reach the region of fast strong shear, because it takes very little time to make 100% deformation in that limit. So let me further demonstrate to you what you can learn from rheology. If you put a sample in between power play, you don't know what it is, and start to shear it, so-called startup. If it's a liquid, Newton tells us you should have stress right away, from t equals zero onward. If it's a liquid, solid, then of course, Hooking's law applies you should uh, uh, have uh, stress growing from zero. I see, I still have uh, misspelling on books. So in any case, what if uh, you deal with our dear polymer that's neither liquid or solid? Then conceivably, you must undergo what I see in this show as in this red curve, initially solid-like, and ultimately, if you are ever, ever able to reach that steady state, stress will not be changing. So something must link them. Something must link them even in the limit of small Weissenberg numbers. And of course, when the Weissenberg number is very large, the stress does not grow without bound. It must eventually converge to that. And that's, the origin. that's why you see stress overshoot. So I was eager, I'm eager to go on to immediately tell you what we can learn from this ABC of rheology. First of all, uh, shear thinning, famously known. What extreme shear thinning immediately means is you have so-called a stress plateau. I want to give you this insight, that blue line. Look, you can have a huge amount of rate change with a very narrow range in, rate, in stress. If this is true, which nobody disputes, then, that's over 10 years ago, we were crazy enough to do rheology in a slightly different way. We're going to use constant stress grab at constant stress rheometer. Then I want to indicate to you, if I apply that stress as indicated by the horizontal stress line, the system initially happily sitting in the well-entangled state with a viscosity on the left, it must go to the eventual point on the right. This could be many order magnitude. So we think, and, and, and of course in doing so, uh, you better be sure that your material behaves in the sense there is no edge fracture and the edge issues. And I show you this paper worried a lot about that. And it, really, the edge fracture killed them, killed most people from moving forward into the strong nonlinear region. So nevertheless, we had a sample that was just behaving perfectly nicely, no edge effect. And this, what the data cannot lie, this, this is plotted right as a function of time. So at the constant stress, it creeps and eventually creeps much faster. It's a rotational rheometer, so it eventually spins much faster and reaches a constant rate. And we call that entanglement disentanglement transition. And these folks uh, immediately uh, re responded by saying, oh, if you have edge effect, it will not be the case. This could be just edge effect. 
I think in science, the most challenging thing is sorting out the causality. If you are confused about cause and effect, everything will be confused. So if you really worry about edge effect, like Dimitri mentioned yesterday, you can really uh, get hold of uh, a, a so-called PPT design, a CPP design, and then you can get rid of the edge. I know it's a distorted ring here, so aspect ratio is not right. So in any case, you can make sure that uh, what you observe has nothing to do what's, with what's happening outside. In fact, you can, uh, if you are not happy with it, your material ultimately, ultimately, accumulate some edge effect, and you blame that for what you observe, then get rid of it by CPP. Or you can, for example, this new sample was prepared with only 3% of polymers. And the sample is so inelastic, so soft, that it's incapable of showing any edge effect. And then this movie, just watching the meniscus moving around. And you can see also the meniscus is undergoing non-uniform here, eventually. So in any case, let me return to the, my favorite idea about what I should think about in terms of polymers undergoing shear, strong shear, well, high Weizenberg number here. Uh, that is, uh, it's elastically responding first, and then ultimately a point is reached further build up of stress is impossible, and eventually you approach the flow state. So there is necessarily a transition from elastic to irrecoverable deformation. And this point I started to call the yield point. It turns out Bryce Maxwell in 79 proposed that first, who was the advisor of my chair, actually. Uh, so if you're not convinced about how significant this point is, the overshoot, you can do a recovery experiment. Again, you need to get hold of a stress control rheometer. You shear it up to any point before the maximum and let go, it will return. And if further beyond that point, let go, it will not return. So clearly, there is some significance about that point. Moreover, uh, can this so-called yield, I start to call this yielding, right, happen uniformly? So I'm happy further uh, um, uh, with this lecture invitation that this is 10 years we celebrate when we first observed it, exactly 10 years ago. PDV. So we uh, had a number of papers uh, basically building a $300 device on a $100,000 machine. And uh, by looking at the, the gap, you find that uh, the response is no longer homogeneous. Well, this, of course, uh, is rather disturbing. But the good news is it is also uh, very insightful. So we actually went down to do something much simpler. For those who worry about edge effect, somewhere there, uh, do step strength. Do 200% step strength. You have to be out of your mind to think there is edge effect that's going to kill your observations. 2H to the right in simple shift. And we did that. We took a piece of melt, SBR. We super glued it onto the plate so there's no wall slip. We moved it 200%, and look, after 10 seconds, it started to break up in the middle. Uh, this, is, uh, this movie is available in the literature, and, and so I will be rather quick on, on, on any of this. So in any event, you have uh, a break up in the middle of this innocent male after stopping shearing. So let me summarize. In either case, we see that through the PTV, that there will be a, apparently, OK, we have, we have no molecular means, but it looks like phenomenologically, apparently, the structural breakdown occurred in a localized, inhomogeneous manner through the PDV that we observed. Uh, it actually teaches us something very remarkable to me. That is, uh, all viscoelastic material, if you are able to resolve it time-wise, temporarily, uh, you will have a yield. yield. A phenomenon. So uh, further to characterize this, anytime you have viscoelasticity, the elastic part, you must be searching for a structure that's responsible for it. Then for large deformation, there's only the question of whether that structure can sustain and survive the large deformation. And in the case of entangled polymers, it turns out it cannot sustain 
indefinitely amount of deformation, it reaches a point where it will disentangle. That I will explain a little more closely later. And it was corresponding to that that we see the structural failure transitioning from elastic, like a rubber, and to a piece of a fluid. So if this concept is, uh, there's nothing special about shear. So if this concept is uh, valid, then it should be valid for extension. You know, we, in, in rheologists, you know, we typically either play with shear or, re, uh, or extension. We don't normally do both. And I saw the opportunity to enter extension that I'm scared to go in. But now I see I can understand it. So how do I understand it? First of all, borrow the same insight with shear, you have a maximum. I realized, I will explain more, that my extension should also reach a point of, of yielding. It should also yield. Then what would be the signature for it? It's that simple. The extension must also yield under the condition of large Weissmuller numbers. The disentanglement must also take place. What's the signature? Well, it turns out the signature is something people really don't like, so-called the engineering stress, not the true stress that we're familiar with. So it turns out, I will explain more. It turns out there's a maximum in that tensile force once you reach that point, there will be yielding demonstrated by this kind of recovery experiment that I, that's similar to the, to the shear. And if you look at the true stress, you know, divided by the average shrinking area, that signal is featureless in the sense you don't see anything going wrong. Everything is monotonic in the true stress because you are dividing a diminishing force by an even more strongly diminishing cross-sectional area. So it turns out that this is the data that shows the same stuff. So with that, we start to look for what's the features in extension. In particular, we really confirmed that, that there will be a maximum in the tensile force or engineering stress. Moreover, what we discovered was that upon reaching that point and beyond, Uniform extension is no longer possible. The sample breaks apart. This is the part that has to do with considered criteria, but I have no time to get into that. About the application of considered criteria, in my opinion, is again a reversal of causality. So in any event, the insight was very simple. If you have many strands that's producing the tensile force, it will give you a continuously increasing tensile force unless you start to lose the entanglement, lose some of the low-bearing strands. That's why the maximum has the feature signature. So moreover, if, uh, if uh, a step strand could cause the sample to break apart after scission of deformation, then we predict, you know, after stretching a filament and hold it, it should break up. So this comes as a prediction, and then we went to the lab and confirmed. Similar to, to what we observed in extension, in shear. Okay. So let's move on. So these are the way I have unified shear and extension. There are famous differences. One of the most important differences was the so-called strand hardening. When I say so-called, uh, uh, there are some uh, 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 comments about whether we truly uh, have an understanding of why such differences occur. That is, if you plot transient viscosity as a function of time, you find relative to the zero shear transient viscosity, the shear sample always give you strength softening and uh, some of the melts give you strength hardening in extension uh, with the data going above it. Uh, it turns out that one of the leading features of this difference is not coming from anything other than elementary geometry or kinematics. Okay, I want to get that part out first. So in other words, for the zero shear envelope, it's a good reference for shear to consider what happens when you have high shear. Because your shearing area does not change. So the softening is just a matter of losing entanglement. I'm using dots to represent my low bearing strands in the cross-sectional direction. Simil conversely, in the extension, when I stretch more, if I don't lose entanglement, if I somehow have a way to prevent yielding and disentanglement, then I'm having geometrical condensation. And this produces the strange differences. And that difference is occurring because we are comparing uh, different things. 
So in any case, I, I limited time. I, I don't want to dwell further on it. Uh, famous example of strand hardening. I think the reason we call it strand hardening, first of all, is because we find that to be strange, that behavior. So if I were looking at this data freshly, I may not call it strand hardening, per se. And then you have data just like this, as shown in the, in the figure. The zero rate envelope is this one. OK. If you replot that data in the so-called engineering stress, you find something like this. Or if you blow up further, it looks, you know, just blow up a small region of that data. You look at this. What happens? Just as I told you, you have hooking like rubber elastic response initially. And then it's not able to become rubber elastic anymore. And the stress stop, the force stop growing. But when you have launching and branching, this force does not catastrophically decrease. It stays relatively flat, resisting breakup of the chain network. And this allows you to have half to harvest the geometric condensation and produce the so-called strand hardening. Well, having said this rather superficial difference between shear and extension, there is one that's relatively more profound. It turns out if you try your luck further, and increase your rate further. You find instead of having your tensile force reaching a maximum, it no longer does so. The tensile force will monotonically grow, as shown in this data. Conversely, for the same very same rate in shear, it will still do strength softening. That is a truly profound difference. Somehow, you are lose your ability to undergo yielding, or complete yielding at least, and complete disentanglement in extension, but you still have that yielding and, and disentanglement in shear. This, doesn't this bring me back to the question, the two core questions rheologists must face again? Why you can have chain deformation? And when does it stop happening, right? And, and flow begins. So these two questions. So any deeper understanding in polymer rheology must deal with these two questions directly, explicitly. Why I could aff apply a fine deformation so that I can say my molecules are deforming just like external deformation shields, and when it stops doing that. So th let me. Re this re allows me to reach the second part, which again has a lot to do with uh, uh, actually uh, data for the reason that I will show you in the last part. Because uh, equipped with the new emerging picture, that the understanding associated with it, we could look for new phenomena. So I see I'm uh, quite on time. So let me take it easy and, and, and go through this uh, uh, you know, leisurely. Uh, of course, we all know the transit network uh, theory. And of course, we, we all know why uh, the reputation is such a celebrated idea. Because this transit network theory uh, allows you to assign some transit ni lifetime to a gene of the network. Uh, if you want to describe shear thinning or even old stress overshoot, you can put some arbitrary dependence of this lifetime on shear rate and so on and so forth. But it's all ad hoc. Let alone, even that relaxation, you have nothing to say about this molecular weight dependence. So it's clearly not where we eventually want to be if we want to use molecular design to guide our polymer process. And of course, later there was uh, also Tanaka uh, Edwards' uh, 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 work on, on, uh, chain ne uh, on network theory. Uh, but they are not really intending to apply it to our untangled solutions and melts. So I'm not going to uh, go into it. And so, quick. Uh, uh, between trans network, trans network model and rotation idea, that's a 25-year gap. But it's, that's why it's so celebrated. So we had a notion of how to think about molecular motion because of the gen. And then it's a matter of putting that into a, a form that allows you to be quantitative about nearly all aspects of viscoelasticity. Firstly, linear response, and eventually even nonlinear response. 
But for the nonlinear response part, I borrow what Ken Schweizer commented. That is, in this depiction, the tube is always there. The chains is always in a tube. Therefore, you always have entanglement network. It is confined in a harmonic potential. In other words, the confining force will grow if you try to drag it out. So, uh, a word about, I, I know I skipped so much about what uh, all the work, so many generations uh, of work that's been done. And uh, a quick summary would be there are lots of uh, uh, worry about linear response, and, and certainly I, I, I even skipped most of, uh, you know, there was most of, uh, uh, of the constitutive approach to it, uh, but I do mention some. Uh, in any event, at the end of the day, it all boils down to agreeing that the Q model is quantitative and should give us a good depiction of what's going on. Uh, but as people like Arthur Large, uh, the late Arthur Large mentioned, uh, and certainly Ken Schweder mentioned again and again, uh, this approach is clearly not self-consistently formulated. So it treats the and you know, that ball of spaghetti it treats that very specific complex interaction in this smooth style uh, fashion, thinking that a, a chain could live happily in a tube, smooth tube. So in recent years, uh, because of uh, the emerging phenomenology, uh, Sassman and Schweizer have been working on a self-consistent treatment of entanglement. That's uh, just a nearly infinitely hard and therefore almost intractable problem. Uh, but they are dealing with it and with the considerable success. So for, since this is a French audience and, and, and uh, uh, just for completeness, I should also mention IPG, I, uh, IBAR, uh, I think uh, the interactions should be thought of in some other language, some meso phase. Uh, I know I'm not going to get into that uh, non-conventional, uh, non-classical, uh, no time for that. So we're going to still stay with a case where it's homogeneous, chains are just chains, no different aggregation of faces, and we're going to quickly realize that, that the question to address is the two questions I, 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 I already mentioned to you. Why you could have chain deformation? When does the fine deformation ceases? Okay. So it turns out, we realized, inspired by the PTV, the particle tracking movie, that showed that structures are breaking apart. So I must consider something uh, from having elastic deformation to the point of termination of that, uh, that we should consider three forces. And in particular, we should consider how the three forces interplay. And if you look, read this paper carefully, you realize only the second force, elastic retraction force, is something we are familiar with. It's in the literature. The other two forces, I introduced them anew at that time. In short, if I worry about how a chain deforms, look at that red one, then I realize it happens because, in absence of cross-linking, because other chains are there, the blue ones. And why the blue ones are there? What well, you can imagine eventually, remember, this is shear. We're not even doing simulations. This is experiment. Eventually, this network is permeating from one end of my shearing surface to the other end of a shearing surface. When I shear this two surface, if I anchor my chain to the surface, then these blue chains will display. So eventually, I can see, think about interior, anywhere, this is what's happening. And as I deform more, because of uncrossability, the red chain will be stretched more. But this will not grow without bound. This process cannot proceed forever. The retraction force will grow, but it's caused by the presence of other chains that is grabbing it to grow. So you will reach a point of force imbalance I see my, my movie got the, get the block in this part. Basically, you'll find a point where these two forces become equal. And that's the point beyond which the red chain cannot deform more. 
In fact, sliding will take place. And if you stop sharing, that's another feature, very, very striking. If you have not reached the force imbalance, you have not reached the point my red chain can no longer stretch more. Even before that, if you stop it, then the blue chain is not making that action of stretching it. It turns out there is only an entropic barrier that could sustain, could provide some counterbalance to the force. And that force typically is quite small. Therefore, if you treat this as a prediction, you will predict after a large step strain, things will go crazy. Disentanglement can take place because you induce force balance, imbalance as well. So let me just, I have uh, just enough time to go through it. Let me go through what I call, based on that picture, 10 predictions. I already mentioned two about when I unified the extension this year. So there's are the remaining predictions. And let's go back to our dear problem of uh, wall slip. I told you before, if we don't understand wall slip, there's no way to understand nonlinear reality of shear. So for example, uh, this is, you know, I show two movies. I, I know you cannot watch both of them at the same time. But basically, you can see that, uh, that you have nice, perfect shear in the beginning, and then you lost contact at the surface. And the sample snaps back, recoils back. And in some lucky cases, or unlucky cases, this boundary actually will uh, not be able to make up its mind. See, it sticks, slips, stick, and slips. So that's slip. And this is the first prediction. Short of time, I'm playing both movies at the same time. We predict, and then went to the lab and see and then publish the paper. We predict if I share a piece of sample and stop it before wall slip takes place. But when it stops, we predict it will undergo wall slip. I, I can go into the details, but I don't have time about explaining that. But you can predict if you absorb, you know, if you digest what I said before, the, 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 build, the stress you're building there is, it is too much once you stop. And we further predict that this feature of shear banding, in this case, I'm shearing both plates. Uh, can be avoided. When I first suggest this, nobody believes it, my student. So uh, if you slowly apply that rate to the eventual rate, same rate, it turns out I can avoid shear banding. And that has uh, important theoretical implications regarding one aspect of the symptom in the tube model. Uh, look, same boundary, you can have shear banding or no shear banding. And uh, we further envision that uh, that if you have long chain branching, yesterday's topic, then that long chain branching really could deter breakup of a, of a, you see this one, linear one breaks. And with long chain branching, it will not break. And moreover, we uh, think we understand why at least in a limited way, why sometimes there is vortex, for, vortex formation, let's say, in LDPE, and then there's no vortex formation, let's say, in HDPE. And we uh, simulated that problem using a, a untangled uh, DNA solutions. We showed, for example, when the concentration is high, you don't have vortexes. When you reduce the concentration to half, you have vortex formation. You can do it in a different way. Same concentration. Now I'm going to regulate that phenomenon by using different solvent. So in one case, I have a solvent that is very viscous. I add to that water, uh, you know, aqueous based solvent with sugar to make it more viscous, causing vertex formation to occur. And in absence of that, I have no, uh, I have no vortex formation. So this is our kind of like a prediction, and we went out and tested. And it turns out it has all to do with regulating the effect of having disentanglement, or regulating the magnitude of so-called wall slip, if you like. Uh, I know I, I don't have uh, enough time to go into more details. Uh, one of the last things, being properly at the 
PPS, I was of course deeply uh, uh, interested in uh, being helpful uh, for polymer processing. And this kind of problem, this, you know, perturbs me for a long time, right? Extrusion and then extruded distortion. So this sample was prepared by first uh, uh, extrude material into the die, let the die, let the material rest, and then reapply the pressure. And then you find the first part comes out smoothly because it rested in the die already. The rest of the material freshly being extruded out uh, shows a tremendous distortion. As, as this uh, steel, uh, uh, steel uh, picture shows. So to uh, have a better sense of that, uh, and certainly a nice geometry, because there is no edge, there's no free water, there's nothing open in this closed system, you do a piece of a PDV in a movie by looking at half of the corner, and look at half of that corner, it's undergoing some it's called shear bending, internal slip, whatever you call it. It made up its mind that it will start to develop a boundary when this nice resting untangled polymer was being forced to squeeze into that narrow gen channel. So this is just to show you a variety of such features depending on the molecular weight and different polymers. And, uh, it all, uh, and uh, because this is such an open system, unlike the simple shear where you can claim to have a constant shear stress at every layer, this is such an extended, spatially extended region. The system cannot really ma make up its mind in terms of making sure that the slip, uh, internal slip always occurs in the same location. So it's quasi chaotic. And as a consequence, this effect, unable to relax during the capillary flow part, the residence time is so short, uh, it comes out uh, because of the feature that's so randomly uh, taking place. So the dice wall and whatever feature that shows up is somewhat random. So lastly, one of the last one, uh, squeeze. I know I, I learned rheology and, and Chris McCoskill's book talked about squeeze. So we actually had the squeeze and we visualized that uh, uh, something interesting could happen in principle. Uh, uh, for example, in this movie, you squeeze with a constant force and hold it, and you find after a while the sample will undergo shear yielding and break apart. In this case, you'll find at the end, see that? At the end, it's no longer undergoing the nice kinematic squeezing. Instead, some structural failure takes place, as anticipated invasion. So, of course, uh, we uh, you know, think we really understand the interplay between slip and internal shear bending. And I wrote a paper that principally discussed, uh, roughly speaking, when you can have either side, either dominant uh, uh, behavior, either slip-like or shear bending-like. The boundary is always more complicated, you know, at the boundary, okay? So one should, if you read my paper, understand my paper, one should never examine anything along that line, which is Greg McCannon did. So in the region that's largely slip and largely shear bending, you should find what I predict. And lastly, uh, it turns out that you can appreciate a little more and find out that, uh, that uh, you can have a uh, different type of uh, uh, failure. And I know I'm uh, just about to run out of time. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip this type of failure. Uh, as, as, a, as a summary, I'm writing up this uh, in, in, a, in a book that hopefully I can have it uh, uh, finished this year. And you can see that uh, it will have four parts and uh, certainly wall slip is the important part. I'm labeling some of the page numbers. I spent 30 pages on wall slip. 30 pages on yielding, 20 pages on shear bending, and then plenty on, you know, extension, uh, or other forms of, like, of uh, strength hardening and other things, as well as discussing the theoretical frameworks. So it's a large uh, undertaking, but uh, hopefully it has reached the end. So in any event, I think uh, without question that we all played with the rheology with the constitutive equations and following the tradition of Maxwell, and uh, I think we have to uh, deal with the fact the molecular interactions in the entangled polymer case uh, 
it, it's challenging to treat it as a smooth uh, interaction. So what I cannot answer is uh, how, how this will develop for processing. I, I can only hope that what I discussed today uh, could uh, lead to uh, better ways to process our polymeric materials. And largely, as you know, that uh, 100 billion pounds, they are largely all untangled polymers, and certainly rubber and polyethylene are particularly uh, prone to, to the problem uh, because of their high level of untanglement. So lastly, appropriately for, uh, because it's in PPC, uh, I want to mention that uh, actually you, uh, you, if you, uh, if you, uh, so if you, polyethylene, uh, polystyrene is very brittle, but if you melt stretch polystyrene, you'll find it will turn ductile. I know I, I, I'm running out of time to play this move. So, here is a place rheology really is impacting processing. Brittle polystyrene upon male stretching can be completely ductile, like polycarbonate. It's not something it's unknown, but we are starting to understand why that happens. So there are generation of students, I, I know I, uh, I'm running out of time again to, uh, to go into details about that. Uh, with that, I, I will just let you read the conclusions basically. It is a challenging problem, but gapping, uh, bridging gaps of six order magnitude, and uh, uh, hope we're getting somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have some I think time. That we are going to have. A, we have. Thank you for your presentation, and thank I you. know that uh, Professor Wong will. Be able to answer some questions uh, for us this time. Yeah. And I'd like to give you a small gift Thank from you. our organization. And we're going to change over the computer to show for the next uh, year's meeting. Do you have time? No, no, no time. No, no, no. Wow. Okay. Thank okay.